On Tuesday, February 8th, SpaceX and Starlink officially confirmed what many people started speculating about on Twitter is that its newest batch of Starlink satellites, launched on Thursday, February 3rd, may have had an issue in orbit and didn't quite get to where they wanted to go. Some speculated it may have been the rocket itself, but what we are finding out from SpaceX and Starlink is that it actually is related to space weather, or events that come from the sun that impacted satellites in orbit. It's not the first time we've seen satellites get impacted, however, this may be the most sudden impact to satellites we have seen on record. In fact, not only did it take down one Starlink satellite, it took down up to 40 of its newest batch of satellites. So in this video, we're gonna talk about what exactly space weather is and how this event impacted Starlink so significantly. So first, broad brush. What is Starlink if you don't know? Well, real quickly, Starlink is going to be an internet service which will cover the entire world powered by satellites in low Earth orbit. The goal is to provide internet service to people in more rural areas that may not have access to high-speed internet. Full disclosure, I use Starlink at my house. So that's a thing that's happening right now. So what is space weather? Space weather events are events that happen on Earth but are caused by the sun. We're gonna be focusing primarily here on geomagnetic storms. They're rated like hurricanes on a one through five scale, G1 through G5. The event that happened on Friday, February 4th, which impacted the Starlink satellites was the lowest, just a G1 or a KP5 event. However, the first impacts to Earth and the first time that the Earth was feeling the effects of space weather actually started as early as February 1st, a prolonged stretch of active weather. And this is not unusual because we are entering solar cycle 25. A solar cycle is a roughly 11 year period of time when the sun is getting more and more active, more and more sunspots or dark areas on the surface of the sun that may produce these solar flares occur. In fact, as of this video, no day in 2022 has gone without a sunspot. Now this solar cycle 25 is starting off more active than forecast, but again, we are on the upwind here. The peak of the solar cycle will happen around 2025 to 2026. So getting all these active solar flares is definitely not that unheard of, and in fact, is likely to be expected. So the sun can produce these events called solar flares. Solar flares are essentially a huge plume of energy that gets shot out by the sun. Again, we're gonna keep things pretty simple for this video. Now, here on Earth, we see the impacts of those solar storms. However, our magnetic field protects us from any real threat of them. However, if you get a really bad solar storm, the way the particles in the atmosphere interact with the magnetic field coming from the sun can actually have impacts to the power grid as well as satellites in low Earth orbit. And satellites in particular are susceptible to solar storms because they're not as protected. Now I want to go through kind of a time of the events as they unfolded with this event. There was a Warning well ahead of time, a watch and warning for the initial impact from a coronal mass ejection back in late January. We had that impact of the CME on February 1st at 2145 Zulu. That's when the solar weather really began ramping up. And this continued at least through February 5th, a prolonged stretch here of active weather. What I want to point out is that there was a KP5 warning anticipating the potential threat of reaching KP5 through at least February 1st into the 2nd, late the 1st into the 2nd. And we did, in fact, reach that KP5 level on February 3rd at 0846 Zulu. There was a warning ahead of time, and that warning did specify minor impacts to satellite operations are possible. But this is still ahead of the launch. I want to take you inside the launch window. That was on February 3rd at 1813 Zulu. And what you'll notice is that there was, in fact, the KP-5 warning was extended well through the launch window of the Starlink mission. And that did continue to specify minor impacts to satellite operations possible. And this warning was continued and extended through February 4th. Now, I believe the time frame that when things really went downhill is when KP5 was reached on February 4th at 1605 Zulu. And this is about 24 hours after launch. Again, there was a warning ahead of time for potentially reaching KP5. And that's when we did in fact reach KP5 on February 4th. And that is when SpaceX claims that uh, the geomagnetic storm had an impact on their operations. And again, there was adequate warning from the Space Weather Prediction Center talking about the potential of impacts to satellites. So 
again, to summarize, we're in a new solar cycle, solar cycle 25. We're on the upwind, heading uphill on towards the peak of this solar event. And again, we expect a lot of solar storms. That's not uncommon for this event. So why did this impact Starlink so significantly on this go around? Well, we're gonna take the magic whiteboard here and we're gonna talk a little bit about why this unfolded the way it did and how Starlink satellites are in particular susceptible to solar events. So say you have the Earth right here. There is your Earth. Starlink satellites operate above the Earth's atmosphere, which extends out like so. This is the atmosphere. The atmosphere is made up of lots of different particles, like oxygen and nitrogen molecules, all hanging out inside this atmosphere. Those molecules are inside the atmosphere there. Starlink satellites operate above most of the atmosphere, not all the atmosphere, but most of the atmosphere. That atmosphere could extend as far out as the moon, for example, but they operate at about 500 and 50 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. Traditional satellites um, that are providing internet to the world, uh, say operated by Viasat, are known as its geostationary orbit. That's about 35,700 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. Starlink having the advantage being in low Earth orbit because that allows them to provide much faster internet with much better latency. Basically the ability for you to connect to a server that allows you to play games better, video chat better, being in low Earth orbit. So there's an advantage there. But here's why Starlink is susceptible to these solar storms. Here's what happens. Say you got the sun right here. It fires off a coronal mass ejection. That coronal mass ejection then interacts with Earth's magnetic field. That solar storm then, geomagnetic storm, heats up the atmosphere. As the atmosphere heats up, it expands. As the atmosphere expands, more molecules begin pushing outward from the surface of the Earth. The atmosphere gets larger and larger. And so these satellites in low Earth orbit are now impacting more of these molecules of the atmosphere, therefore encountering what's known as atmospheric drag. Basically, they're getting slowed down by hitting more and more of these molecules, and they can no longer maintain this perfect orbit and may re-enter Earth's atmosphere crashing. So again, that's pretty much a summary of what's happening here. You have the Earth, the atmosphere. The atmosphere is expanding as it's heated up by that solar geomagnetic storm. From that impact of the sun's solar storm, that's impacting your atmosphere. That sun is heating up the atmosphere. The atmosphere is expanding. More and more molecules are pushing outward from the surface of the Earth and therefore impacting more and more satellites, and those satellites are getting bogged down. So why was this so devastating for Starlink? Flip the board around. So traditionally, again, SpaceX Starlink satellites operate at 550 kilometers, but before they reach their operational altitude, they're slowly raised. And when they're in these lower levels, they're doing in-orbit checkouts. That's just to make sure that they're functioning as they should be. The reason Starlink operates them at a much lower altitude earlier on is that if one of these Starlink satellites has an issue, it won't be a threat to satellites operating in their traditional altitude. If you had a satellite that's defunct up here, it could pose a threat to other satellites operating at that altitude, not only Starlink satellites, but any satellite, or maybe the International Space Station. So as it's going under checkouts here in the lower level of the atmosphere, it is much more susceptible to drag. So it's sitting right over that fine line of the atmosphere, but as it expands just a little bit more, more of these satellites are getting impacted by those molecules of the atmosphere. Therefore, there is our problem. The Starlink satellites were still in this checkout phase. And once the solar storm impacted, SpaceX put those Starlink satellites into a safe mode to protect them from the solar storm, 40 of those satellites did not come out of that safe mode and the impact of the density, the increasing density of the atmosphere, more and more molecules as it got heated up, that's gonna bring those satellites back down to Earth. So again, to summarize, the G1 geomagnetic storm added enough heat to the atmosphere, the atmosphere expanded, those satellites hit more and more molecules as the density of that position that they were in increased bogging them down, that's when they re-entered Earth's atmosphere because of that atmospheric drag. That was why 40, at least up to 40 Starlink satellites will re-enter. 
So why did this happen with just a G1 storm? Well, part of the issue is how long this has been ongoing. Again, think back to the beginning of this video, we were talking about impacts of space weather all the way back to February 1st. And during that entire window, all the way through when these satellites encountered the problem on February 4th, that atmosphere was taking on that solar storm, that geomagnetic storm. And again, to recap, the launch actually occurred in the middle of a G1 storm. You can see here, February 3rd, 18 Zs right about here, right in the middle of this G1 warning. This G1 watch continued all the way through at least 0Z February 4th. But again, you can see these warnings did continue and they were issued well ahead of time all the way into February 5th. There was a break here late February 5th and then more warnings took over February 6th before things have really calmed down since. But they launched right in a window of very active solar weather. Now, overall, this will continue to be a threat for satellites in the future. This is not the first time this has happened to a satellite provider. There have been instances in the past of strong solar storms knocking out satellites and breaking satellites. In fact, the very similar case of a very high-end solar storm increased the atmosphere's density in the very high altitudes and actually was part of what brought down Skylab way back in the day. So yes, there have been instances of this happening in the past. This is not the first time. And unfortunately, this will be something that will have to be contended with. Now, thankfully, we are doing a lot more research. There's a lot of projects out there to try and better understand the impacts of space weather, better predict space weather as well, and also to build more resilient satellites in orbit. And of course, not only satellites getting impacted by solar storms, but also the electrical grid on Earth is pretty susceptible to very high-end solar storms. So the more we can learn, the better. That's where the Parker Solar Probe launch came into play in 2018. That's going to continue to find more and more things. And there's a lot of other projects out there as well. So again, that's a summary on how the sun destroyed 40 Starlink satellites. I hope you found this video interesting and educational. Again, I don't do these types of videos too often, but I really do enjoy them. If you think I should do them more, let me know in the comments below. Let me know what you thought about this video. Did you learn anything? Did you find it interesting? Please let me know. Please subscribe for more videos as well. And if you're on this channel, feel free to check out some of my other videos, including some of my Starlink content, other spacey and sciencey nerdy stuff, and also have a lot of storm chasing content as well. Thanks for watching, everybody. Give this video a like if you liked it, and we'll see you again in the next video.